So just a little bit about Laszlo Bach. Um, he is, as you know, Senior Vice President of uh, People Operations at Google. And apropos of this weekend's event, he's also the executive sponsor of the Talks at Google program, which has hosted hundreds, no thousands of authors since 2006. And you can find that program if you go to YouTube and uh, put in Talks at Google. They're absolutely fantastic talks, just like the ones this weekend that you can find there. And Laszlo hosts that at Google. Um, his background, he was born in communist Romania, and he's worked a huge variety of jobs, including startups and nonprofits and acting. He has had executive roles at General Electric Company, management consulting at McKinsey Company. He arrived at Google to head people operations in 2006, so almost 10 years, close. Um, during his tenure at Google, uh, Google's been named the best company to work for more than 30 times. And apparently for good reason, according to LinkedIn, Google is the most sought after place to work on the planet. And they receive more than two million applications every year, and they hire only several thousand per year. And it's 25 times more selective than Princeton, Harvard, or Yale. But today, Google's secrets have come to you. In this book and in Laszlo Bach, we welcome him to the stage today at the Bay Area Book Festival. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. How are folks doing? Good, OK. This is, I think 2 o'clock is a good time because you're not suffering from the post-lunch like blood sugar drop. So is everybody sugared up and ready to like tough it out? Um, Thank you, Sherilyn, for the lovely introduction and for actually organizing this thing. This is the first year this thing's in existence, this festival. You're expecting over 100,000 people. And thanks to all of you who actually care about books and reading and coming here to pay attention and, and you know, support all these, these other authors, right? Like, I'm, I'm good. Google's going to be fine. But the, the other authors, you know, please you know, support them. And thanks for coming out and doing that. Um, I should also mention, the we do do a series at Google, and this isn't a commercial for it, but um, where people come and give authors talks, and we post them all on YouTube. And actually, one of the people behind it, the heart and soul of it, happens to be sitting right here, Ann Farmer. Um, so Ann, can you stand up? And They're book lovers. They appreciate it. And it was kind of cool. Like, I haven't done much of this, but there was like a green room for authors. And somebody I met had actually just come from giving a talk that now is going to be on YouTube, and everyone can watch it and learn about her book. It's just, it's a cool thing. So, and Anne does it as a volunteer job in addition to her day job. Because we have this thing called 20% time, where you can do kind of whatever you want with 20% of your time. And that's what she chooses to do. So thank you, Anne. Um, it's nice to be here. I sort of, uh, you know, I don't live too far from here, but it's always nice coming back to Berkeley uh, to feel like, you know, you're part of the community. I think I was here five minutes walking on the sidewalk when, uh, with, with my family when someone said, share the sidewalk. So it was good to get a real Berkeley introduction and kind of feel like I'm home again. Like, okay, and now I know it's Berkeley. Um, but it's, it actually is also nice because um, one of the things, so wrote this book. And the idea behind it was to kind of share some of the stuff we figured out at Google, um, because Google's actually not special. Um, there's a lot of things we do for our people, and Google gets a lot of press for doing it. But one of the things I've been lucky enough to learn over the last almost decade is there's so many companies doing great things. And the one thing that's a little different is we actually then try to apply science to measure what works and what doesn't and, and sort of improve things. And so the idea was, what if we looked at what all these other interesting places were doing and put in what we were doing? and tested it, improved it, and did the science behind it. And then what if we just said, here, world, go ahead and you know, do what you want with it. And in a way, that's very like, resonant with kind of the spirit of this city, right? This notion of, can you make societies better? What can you do? And I know there's a lot of arguments against Google, and there's a lot of issues uh, in the Bay Area in particular. But um, it, this is really a work of trying to make work better everywhere. And where that realization comes from is um, I was sitting around once, and I realized that on average, we spend more time working than we do anything else in our lives. Anything else. Because nobody works a 40-hour week anymore. Does anybody here 40-hour week? Anyone? One, two, three, four. Like eight people out of, you know, since this is being video recorded from the two or 3,000 packing this arena, um, <laughs> the eight out of nine people. Um, 
uh, for the video, the real number is somewhere in between nine and 3,000 in the room. Um, but most of us don't work 40 hour weeks anymore. You take your work home with you, you have a device, you feel tethered and tied to it. And it's kind of crazy because you spend more time working than you do with your loved ones. More time working than you do with your husband, your wife, your domestic partner, your significant other. The people you love the most in life actually get less of you than the morons at the office, right? And for most people on this planet, work is a really kind of miserable experience. I mean, I've got a great job, but I have days which are pretty bad. And I've had jobs, I mean, I remember working as a waiter, which I learned, I probably learned more doing that job than anything else, but that was a tough job. That was an exhausting job, right? I was talking earlier this week with somebody, I was in a hotel, and um, somebody, uh, one of the housekeeping staff, and they had this wedge kind of shaped tool. So it was a big piece of plastic shaped like a wedge, about this long. Wedge starts here and it's this wide at the end. And I said, what is that? And she said, we use it to wedge the bed up so that we can tuck the sheets underneath. Because she said the company actually, she was working for Disney, she said, the company actually really cares about how we're treated and wants us to be healthy. And I said, how, how does that help you? Like, what's the difference? And she said, well, before that, every day I would go home because my fingers would ache and be sore and be squished because I'm like prying underneath these heavy mattresses to tuck the sheets in, right? So they cared enough to buy these things, wedges, and, and make work better. And not enough organizations do things like that. But a lot do, and that's what I want to talk about today. Um, from the Google perspective, Google gets a lot of, oh, and by the way, what I figure is I'll talk for a little while and um, you know, maybe 20 minutes or so if that works, and then we can do Q&A, and then um, they told us we're going to have to get out promptly for the next speaker, um, but I'll be outside to sign and what have you. So Google gets a lot of press because, um, well, let, let me try it this way. Who here has heard that we have slides at Google? Show of hands. Okay, slides, connecting floors. It's like now it's a standard thing in tech companies, it's kind of weird, because um, it turns out the engineers actually get annoyed by them because it makes noise, and you know, I, want, I just want to work. Um, who here knows we have like bean bags and lava lamps, free foods, foods, free food? <laughs> I'm a writer, not a speaker. Um, and so we do all these things, but who here knows that if you're an employee of Google, and God forbid, you pass away, not only does all your stock vest immediately, and everyone at Google gets stock, but your surviving spouse or significant other gets half your salary for the next 10 years. And if you have kids, the kids get, there's $1,000 paid per month until they turn 18 or 24, depending whether they go to college. Does anyone know about that one? Nice, homework. Um, there's a lot of things we do at the company because it's the right thing to do and that are really what underpin our business. The bean bags, the lava lamps, the food, all that kind of fun stuff is fun and it's great and it's a luxury, but it's not what defines the company and the culture. What underpins the way we think about things at Google are three notions. One is mission. All of us want to connect to something meaningful and at Google it's this idea of organizing the world's information, making it universally accessible and useful. And as corny and trite as it sounds to say a mission matters, it actually does. Because the people who apply to the company and the people who join the company feel in some way connected to that, right? So in my department, people operations, there's people who, are, who do recruiting. And the whole job is you know, find candidates, cultivate them, interview them, assess them, help them join the company. And their view, more often than not, is they're not just hiring people. They're connecting people to something bigger where they can have a huge impact on the world, right? where they're gonna have a lot, they're gonna be able to build great products, serve people, work on Google Maps, do really cool, cool things, right? A woman came up to me before this talk and she gave me a book she'd written and asked me to pass it on to the Google Earth team because she said her husband um, had served in the Cambodian army, like at the time of the Khmer Rouge, right? And he got out and he escaped and she used Google Earth to go find like where he was from and what happened and recreate and tell that story. And she just wanted to pass this on so the team would know they're actually having an impact. So this idea of mission is trying to connect people to what they do. And it turns out that exists in every single job, or it can. There's a woman named Amy Rosinski. Amy's a professor at Yale University, and what she did was she, um, she looked at all kinds of occupations. She looked at doctors and lawyers and sort of white collar jobs, but she looked at housekeepers and janitors and people doing all, you know, manual laborers, carpenters, things like that. And what she found is across professions, one third of people, work for the money. I mean, we all kind of work for the money, right? Otherwise, we'd, we wouldn't do it. That's why they pay us. But one third of people are motivated by the money. One third of people 
are motivated because they want to win. It's a game. I want to get promoted. I want to advance. I want to move up. And one-third of people, regardless of profession, find some meaning in their work and some way to connect for it. And those of you who work in nonprofit, you know this. I mean, that's why you do it, right? Um, but she talked, to, she talked to janitors in a coma ward in a hospital. So these are totally non-responsive patients, right? And, she, and th what these janitors were doing was they would take the art off the walls and move it from room to room and just move the art around. And she went to them and she said, why are you doing this? And they said, well, I feel like in some way the woman, actually, the, the woman she was talking to, and it was mainly women who were in that job at that hospital, this woman told her, well, I feel like in some small way I'm helping this person. If all I do is change it a little bit, maybe in some way they notice, even if they don't give a response, maybe there's some little thing they notice, they appreciate, it helps bring them out. Even if we don't get a response, maybe it makes their life a little bit better. And Amy said to this woman, she said, you get fired for this. Your job is to change bedpans, to change the sheets. It's not to change the decorations. And this woman said, it doesn't matter, because I feel like I'm doing something meaningful. And if you think about the jobs you have or anyone has, we all actually have days where we feel like we did something good for one another. And the research and evidence suggests that when you connect your job to a sense of purpose and meaning, you're happier, you're healthier, you're more productive, you live longer, everyone kind of wins. So this notion of mission undercore, underscores what we do at Google. The second core value of the company is transparency. So we share, part of the reason Google shares very little outside the company is because we share everything inside, or virtually everything. And there's two ways to manage that, right? If you're going to share everything with a bunch of employees, you can either give them a set of rules about, you can share this, 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 but not these hundred other things, and you have to constantly update that. Or you just say, you know what, just keep it in the family, right? So getting approval to write about this stuff was actually a non-trivial exercise. But one of the things we do is every, every, we have a thing every week called TGIF. And at TGIF, what happens, and this has been happening for 16 years, Larry and Sergey get up on stage, and for 30 minutes, they talk about, here's what's happened last week in the company. New product launches, new challenges we have, areas we're winning, areas we're losing. And then they have 30 minutes of Q&A where you can ask them anything, anything at all. So we get questions like, um, you know, is the decision we made about whether or not to offer search in China good or is it evil? Because we decided to stop hosting search in China because, you know, the government was saying, you know, you need to filter your results. And we tried doing that for a while. We put a little label on that said these results are filtered. But eventually it got to the point we had to make a decision. And a rational, reasonable person could say, as we did, that by continuing to do that, we're sort of a party to this. And it crosses the line. We're not going to do it. We're going to make a statement. And an equally rational person could say, actually, we should do that. Because any information is better than nothing. And you want to help, right? You're talking about human beings who are desperate to, to hear more, learn more. And both people could be right. So the way we had the conversation in the company was we said, here's the pros, here's the cons, here's the different sides, and we explained this to everyone in the company. And whether you agree or disagree, people were left with a feeling like, okay, there's been a thoughtful conversation. And we were able to have that because we're transparent about this stuff in the company. And if you think about different organizations, there's this really cool grocery chain in the Midwest called Zingerman's in Michigan. Anybody from Michigan? One person? Three? Yeah, more people? It's amazing, right? It's amazing. And you go there and they've got like all this cool food. But more than that, I was in Ann Arbor a few weeks ago. The guy behind the checkout counter, I mean, honestly, it, it was like he just won the lottery. Because I go in and I'm like, oh, you know, I'd like a bagel. He's like, that's fantastic. What kind of bagel would you like? We got this bagel, this. And I'm like, oh, how about, you know, you know onion bagel, whatever. And he's like, you know, we've also got coffee cake. Have you tried the coffee cake? Do you want me to cut you a slice so you can see? Like he loved being there, right? And what do they do at Zingerman's? At Zingerman's, they're transparent. If you're an employee in this grocery chain, you can see all the financials of the company. You can see how much money they make on every orange and every slice of coffee cake, and then you decide how you want to do your job, right? So he's in the coffee cake bagel department, and he decides that's how to do it. And I said, how, how do you? You're a little crazy, sir. What, what, why, what is this? And he said, this is just amazing. They treat us well, we know what's going on, we, we get to make decisions. And again, he's a cashier. Like in most companies, his job description is cashier, right? But because they're transparent, it's so much more. And the last notion, so mission, transparency, the third thing that underscores our culture that makes it work is a sense of voice, of letting people shape how the company works. So um, 
you know, the way we, there's a lot of stuff um, that's unique about how we deal with compensation and manage that in the company, and some of that I wrote about. Um, but one of the things we do is when we design what shape our compensation curves are, so everyone in the company, any company, right, you get a performance rating. You know, you're good, bad, mediocre, you know, whatever the scale is. We used to have a scale with 41 different points on it. Um, so it wasn't labeled this way, but it was basically like good, pretty good, pretty, pretty good, really, really good. You know, it's like, it was ridiculous. Um, and then that goes into, like at any company, right, there's a matrix or a formula that says if you're good, here's your bonus or here's your raise. And if you're great, it's this much bigger. And the shape of that curve is actually important because it reflects how much you value exceptional performance versus good performance versus average versus poor performance. The way we figured out how to design that curve was we got a spreadsheet of all our employees. We anonymized it. We took off all the names and identifying information. Then we went to a group of engineers and said, what do you think would be fair? What's the best way to do this? And they helped us design it, and that's how we pay. And the cool thing is, when somebody in the company complains about it, says, well, I don't think it's fair, or I didn't get a raise this year, you know, I'm really upset about that, my team doesn't have to respond. Because the engineers who worked on it will kind of say, like, oh, no, wait, actually, I was involved in that. And here's, here were the trade-offs, and here's why we think, and here's how it works. And it's so much more credible coming from people actually, like, working in the organization rather than, like, you know, the personnel department, right? I mean, we don't call it that, but, you know, there's always skepticism, right? Do we work for management? Do we work for employees? You know what? Employees, you figure it out. And our purpose in people operations is to make sure the outcomes are just, right? To ensure there's justice across the organization. So these notions of mission and transparency and voice really underpin everything we do as we think about people. And I actually believe if you took away all the, like, fanciness at Google, like, you know, if, if the buildings weren't as nice, if we didn't have slides, you know, even some of these benefits, I think people would still feel connected to the company because they feel like they're part of something bigger. And as managers and as individuals and as leaders, the challenge is how do you create that same kind of environment? How do you connect the work someone's doing to something much more meaningful? And do you have the courage to be transparent and open? And I remember once I was giving a talk to, um, to a group of HR people, heads of HR uh, in Chicago, and I was telling him about how the culture works and, uh, and, um, and somebody raised their hand and said, wait, he, you know, this doesn't apply to us. You're Google. You know, you can afford this. You have big margins. You know, we're an insurance company. We can't do anything. And before I could respond, somebody else stood up and said, no, wait, wait. Giving people freedom is free. Treating people like this actually doesn't, nothing that I just talked about costs any money at all, right? Actually, the, the survivor benefit does. But thank God that doesn't happen that often. And when things that are really amazing or awful happen in someone's life, you have a baby, you get married, someone passes away, you got to be there for them, right? And it turns out that actually also makes economic sense. But most of what we do is about the environment. And we're not alone in this. Um, there, years ago, uh, this is actually just in the press again, there was uh, the Rana Plaza building collapsed in, uh, in Bangladesh. You may remember this, right? This was a textile factory. It was like a five or seven store. It was a five-story concrete building in Bangladesh. They built two additional floors, you know, out of code on top of it. And what I didn't realize was that actually what the press covered was that there's, there was like textile workers, you know, 1,100 women and children sewing and knitting and working in this, in this Rana Plaza building. The other floors of the building contained a bank, contained retail shops, right? Like you go buy, sell stuff, whatever. And when they were starting to have earthquakes in the area, the other employers all said, workers stay home. The owners of the textile company said, get back in there. Had an earthquake, the building collapsed. More than 1,100 people were killed. Women, kids. And it was a choice the management made. And it's in the press again because they were just found guilty of homicide, like the Bangladeshi courts, like five years later. But what's crazy is you look at that kind of industry and go like, well, they could never do. You know, that's like, you know, developing a country and, you know, very different economics and the margins are different. What can you do? There's a company called Brandix, B-R-A-N-D-I-X. Brandix is a textile company in Sri Lanka, not that far away from Bangladesh. Largely female workforce, no children because they don't think that's the right thing to do, but almost entirely female workforce. And their workers come in, and they give them all kinds of training. They teach them, they ha actually have classes for them in entrepreneurship, because they think, like, actually, if, you, if your career is spent, if you're going to spend 30 years working in our factory, that's awesome. But most of you should be going off and starting new things. Um, when one of their workers gets pregnant, 
the company gives them food and vitamins because prenatal care actually matters, right? And in Sri Lanka, they know this, right? This company knows this. Um, if you work for them, they will go to your home village and build a well because clean water matters. And yeah, it's clever, you know, marketing and all this kind of stuff because they're, you know, then the village likes the worker, they think well of the company, but that's not why they're doing it. They're doing it because it's the right thing. I talked to their head of HR, I talked to their CEO. When I asked them, you know, why would you do it this way? Why would you run your business? Why would you hurt your margins this way? They basically said, how else could you do this? Because at the end of the day, you, each of us has a choice in how we want to organize our teams and the people around us. And it also turns out if you treat people better, there's, they're more productive. Um, there was a professor at MIT named, uh, I think, Jim Laux, and he did a study. He took two Nike t-shirt factories in Mexico. And one of them, they were making 70 t-shirts per person per day. And he said, okay, that's our control. Keep making 70 t-shirts. And they had traditional management techniques, right? They had quotas, and the managers told them what to do. He went to another one in Mexico, not too far away, and he said, why don't we just let the workers figure it out? And his partners at Nike were like, okay, let's, let's try it and see what happens. That factory increased productivity by 100%. 100%. They went from 70 to 140 t-shirts per person per day. And the effect was, by the way, the employees made more money because they were paid by the shirt. Company also made more money because they're selling more stuff, right? And it was because they gave the local team control. There was another study by a guy named uh, Professor Kamal Burdi of the University of Sheffield. And what he found was that he looked across 30 years of research on uh, operations. So things like Six Sigma and lean manufacturing and all these different programs to see what actually works. And what he found was none of these techniques seem to work consistently. You can always find a company where, you know, you come in, you do all this stuff, works better, fine. But their stories, there's not like a single prescription that he could find which says like, oh, okay, if you do this with operations, it gets much better. The one thing he found across 380 studies that consistently improved performance was empowerment, giving people freedom in every kind of industry. So this is like a real thing and we each have a choice. And you know, most of us don't run companies, but we're members of teams and we should ask for and insist on transparency and voice and the ability to shape our things. And if you start from very little, a little bit of freedom goes a long way, right? I mean, something as simple as a suggestion box. Remember suggestion boxes? Like in the 70s and 80s, like, you know, oh, here's my idea and management would look at it and go, oh, that's a terrible idea, throw it out. And then management decided, why well, have the box if we're never gonna listen? It actually will make a difference, right? Um, there's another thing we do a little differently at Google, which is we try to apply a lot of data and science to figure out what actually works and what doesn't. And if something doesn't work anymore, we stop doing it. Um, one of the, I'll give you two examples. Um, one thing that we did wrong for years and years and years related to our hiring process. So when the company was small, um, you know, hundreds of people, then a few thousand people, we were hiring, you know, hundreds of people a year, maybe a thousand people a year. The easy and efficient and obvious thing to do is only hire people who went to certain schools, right? Can't go wrong hiring a Berkeley grad, right? They're all very smart, pre-qualified, good test scores. We actually would ask everyone for test scores and GPAs. I was talking to somebody earlier about, uh, we hired a guy named Vince Cerf in 2005. So Vint Cerf, one of the two inventors of the internet, three if you include Al Gore. Um, <laughs> he, so he actually invented with, you know, the internet, right? Like starting with DARPA and all this kind of stuff. So we hired him in 2004, 2005. He was 62 or 63 years old at the time, right? The seminal figure in computer science. And, and I asked him, because I, I wanted to make sure this was true, I said, Vint, did Google ask for your college transcript? And he said, Google did. And fortunately, he had good grades, so he was hired. <laughs> so when you're small, it's efficient to do this, right? Because you don't have a lot of resource to go all over the place. What we found and what we proved, and we spent three years studying, it doesn't matter where you went to school. So sorry, Berkeley grads. Um, sorry, Stanford grads, if any are allowed over here. I see one, but Berkeley? Yeah, no, sorry. Um, you'll still be OK. Um, but there's a tremendous amount of great people who never have that opportunity, right? In the United States, only one third of people actually complete college. One third start and never finish, one third never go. They're just as smart, capable as the rest of us, right? Um, so we stopped looking at all that kind of stuff except for brand new college grads because it didn't predict performance. And instead, we got better at assessing people based on, you know, we look at general cognitive ability, we look at emergent leadership. I can in the Q&A talk about this stuff. Um, 
But the data, the evidence was, eh, stuff doesn't matter so much, and there's a better way to do it. And then you read about what's happening in the press about, you know, there, there was a research a few years ago. Do you have an African-American sounding name? This is research out of, I think, University of Chicago. Um, if you have an African-American sounding name, you have to send out 50% more resumes than if you have a white sounding name, right? That's awful. I mean, that is evil. That's wrong, right? It's the reality we live in, but there's got to be a way to fix it. So we looked at our hiring process. We saw no difference because what we do, which I recommend, is when you interview at Google, somebody writes down, whoever interviews you writes down, here's the question I asked, here's the answer that was given, and here's my assessment of that answer. And then they take that right up, and they give it to a separate hiring committee who actually makes the decision. And what's powerful about that is that hiring committee only has the words on the page. You know, I was born outside the US and you know, my parents spoke English with me so my English is, is decent. Um, but they don't know if you have an accent. They don't know the color of your skin. They don't know if you're tall or short or thin or fat. They don't know anything about you other than here is how this person answered this question. And that's how we make hiring decisions. So we can use data to make hiring more objective and make better decisions. The other example is um, we use what are called nudges. So the notion of nudges came out of these two professors, Thaler and Sunstein, who wrote a book called Nudge, which is a great book. But it's about, first of all, realizing that as you sort of go through your life and the environment, you're constantly being manipulated by the environment around you. And I don't mean like subliminal messaging or like commercials or advertising. What I mean is the physical way your offices are set up drives your behavior, right? So, I mean, this room is stadium seating, and I'm elevated. That creates a power dynamic, right? It's actually a little harder to ask a tough question than if we were all just sitting around in a circle, right? It's neither good nor evil. It's just, you know, it's the way the room's set up. In your offices, the same thing happens, right? If you have cubicles versus open space, all these little things actually change behavior. So the idea of nudges is, can you architect this stuff in a way that doesn't restrict choice, doesn't eliminate choice, but encourages people to make better ones? So for example, in our New York office, so we, back to the free food, we have these things called micro kitchens. So every couple hundred yards in any of our building, there's free M&Ms, free granola bars, free fruit, free drinks, all kinds of stuff. And they're all in containers. You just help yourself. So we said, what would happen if we took the sugary snacks and hid them behind an opaque container? So instead of just having the M&Ms lying out or in a big glass bowl, we put them in a bowl that, or a dish that's opaque, right? Um, I actually I took my kids to my office recently, and they got to the micro kitchen, and they, were, they literally one of them, my middle daughter, said, you know, Look for the sealed container. That's where the candy is, right? <laughs> it's like a treasure hunt. So here's what happened. We did this in our New York office. And over a seven-week period, our New York employees, of which there's a couple thousand, they consumed 3.1 million fewer calories. That's a lot of M&Ms, right? And what we found, because what we found was a small, making it a little bit harder. It still said M&Ms on the outside. You knew where they were. But now you got to go over and you're like, oh, I got to open the drawer. I can't. That's like, I'm just going to have an apple. It's right here, right? Like literally that, that's what happens. But the crazy thing is, think about your cupboard at home. Imagine going to your, your pantry. You open the cupboard. What is at eye level? It's a box of cereal? some bars or something, like something you can snack on, something you can grab quickly. Where is like, where is the whole grain, right? Where are like the healthy things, right? The like cans of tuna or the, you know, like anything that's good for you. That's like down on the bottom shelf. That's hard to get to, right? You know, if you have olive oil in there, you know, it's probably on the top shelf, hidden in the back, right? But right up front, you know, you got the candy bars and the cereal because it's easy and convenient. So we use nudges to help people make a better decision in a small way. And you actually can apply that at home too, right? Like go home, rearrange your pantry. You actually be healthier a month later. You'll be a little irritated with me, um, but you'll be healthier. We do the same thing. We, um, we have a retirement plan, 401k. If you put in money, Google matches 50% of it. So every dollar you put in, we put in 50 cents. Um, and it's free money, right? Like if I said, you know, everyone, if you put aside a dollar, I will give you 50 cents. Or if you give, put aside 100 bucks, I'll give you $50 right now. Most people would like say, I'm gonna go save 100 bucks, right? Uh, and then some of you actually wouldn't do it and you'd steal my money and, you know, because most people are good actually, not all of them. Uh, and what we did was we sent a different email out to Googlers, encouraging them to save more. We basically compared them to peers. Because every year you get, you know, hey, we're safe for retirement, it's important. We sent an email that said, compared to other people like you, you're saving 
4%, and on average, people are saving 10%. And people increase their savings rate. Um, that cost us, in the first year, $25 million in extra matching. And for every person who did that, if they keep doing it through their Google career, they'll end up with an extra $260,000 in their retirement account, just from that email. That is a nudge, right? So there's little things we can all do. So the idea behind the book and kind of sharing this stuff is work's got to get better. Work's got to get better. For too many people, they don't have options. And for too many people, the options they have are bad ones. And it's not because managers are evil, but it's because once you become a manager, you want to make sure stuff gets done and you feel accountable, so you very naturally as a human being want to tell people what to do and make sure it happens and make sure it gets delivered. The crazy thing is, if you let go and trust them, and instead of saying, do it this way, say, I don't know, what do you think is the best way? Why don't you try it that way? And if it works, fantastic. If it doesn't work, let's talk about it. If you actually do that, people perform better, they'll love you for it, people will be healthier, and then we're applying science to make it work. And you know, I talked about Zingerman's, I talked about Brandix. Um, there are so many other companies doing great things to treat people well. Um, there's examples in education. There's a school in uh, Santa Clara, Santa Clarita, sorry, Santa Clarita, um, run by a woman named Michelle uh, Krantz, Michelle Colbert Krantz. And um, she's the principal of the school. It's a junior high school. It's a really, it's a largely uh, Hispanic community. Um, and, you know, it's not a socioeconomically well off community. And what she does is every day at the beginning of school, she's standing outside in front of the school. Every kid comes in, she shakes their hand and says, Good morning. I mean, probably not every kid, literally, but, you know, that's what she does. You can come in, you can, and the principal is there saying hi and greeting you by name. Makes you feel important. Costs nothing. With her staff, they have staff meetings, and she'll bring a box of kudos bars. And she'll say, okay, who's done something great? Like, say something nice about someone else. And if you say something nice, you get to give them a kudo bar, right? You give them a kudos. Like, it's cool, right? It's like three bucks a week. She, um, when her staff have birthdays, she writes a birthday card. And one of the people on her team, a gardener who'd been there for 28 years, right? He wrote back to her and he said, in my 28 years here, no one has ever said happy birthday like that. And it means so much to me that you recognize me, that you know I'm there. I will work as hard as I can for you forever, right? That's the impact you can have. That's what we're trying to get across, what I'm trying to get across. So with that, I thank you. I'll, I'll pause for questions. And we've got one person with a mic, two people with microphones. Um, Bill, who just, this keep your hand up till you get a microphone. And then this is a question ahead. about transparency, which a lot of companies talk about. Um, I work for a company, uh, somebody who'd worked there for 20 years was recently let go. It had a really uh, bad effect on morale. The executive team felt that she just wasn't going in the direction that the company wanted to move. However, the people on the ground didn't get it. So my question is, how do you apply transparency in a case like that effectively for everybody? That's, that's a great question and a really tough case because the tension there is between the, you know, it's around the individual's privacy, who's being let go, and how much you want to share. And it's not uncommon for you know, everyone to have one sense of somebody and there to be other things you don't see, right? So one of the things I've seen, for example, is uh, the classic example is somebody who manages up really well and like kicks down, right? And management like, oh, this person's awesome. And you know, no one, you know, it's hard to figure out when you see those kinds of things. So in those cases, I think there's, there's two options, that, two that I would recommend. And when we do this at Google, um, there's often things you can't say out of respect for the person. And sometimes the person who's fired actually doesn't agree. I mean, rarely, rarely does somebody say, oh, thank you for firing me. Like, you know, you are so right about me. You know, I've been stealing it. Like, no one ever says that, right? So it's always painful and, and uncomfortable. Um, so out of respect for not, like, getting that all in the open, often, often it's best kind of not to say anything and to part as friends. However, what you have to be able to fall back on is the underlying system needs to be viewed as just and fair. And ours is not perfect at Google. I don't know anybody who's as like perfect and seamless. Um, but what I mean by that is, you know, at Google, for example, you can't unilaterally fire anybody. You know, I have a big team. I'm the head of people stuff. I can't fire anybody, much as I'd like to some days. Um, because the way it works is 
when, you, when somebody's not performing, you first have to talk to them. You have to have a series of conversations. Um, and then somebody from my team will go in and do an investigation and document and make sure and we try to help them get better and there's all these steps. But if you don't have a process that's fair, you sort of either need the outcome to look fair or the process to feel fair. You need one of those two things for people to kind of be okay with it. If the outcome, as you're describing, doesn't look fair, the process by which they got there needs to be fair and you need as management, as leaders, to be able to say, well, here's the process. You know, maybe not in this case specifically, but what we do is we have this conversation, this conversation, this conversation, we try this and that, and that is a typical case. And often that gives some comfort, um, but that's a really tough thing to be perfectly transparent about in terms of why you made that specific decision. Now it's up, yeah, there we go. So I know that Google, uh, like a lot of the big companies in the Bay Area, uses contractors who work alongside of the direct hires. And I'm wondering what Google does, if anything, special to maintain the sense of justice you spoke about across those two groups that have basically different, uh, well, I wouldn't say rights, but different benefits and so on. Uh, it's a great question. Um, there's two things we've done. Um, one is that, we actually, um, for, well, let me step back. Um, for a lot of our contractors, they're paid well above minimum wage, well above living wage, well above, you know, I mean, they're, you know, if somebody's a contractor at Google doing like engineering work, you're paid like our engineers. If you're a recruiter, you're paid like our recruiters. Um, what typically happens is, because you're not an employee, you don't get stock, but your hourly rate is higher. It's not a perfect match, but it's, the hourly rate ends up being higher than if you were just on salary. But that's like, you know, that's the top 1%, right? Um, for our bus drivers, who um, are largely contracted, uh, our security folks work for us, and we're sort of looking at each and thinking about what's the right thing. For our cafe workers, um, who many of whom are contracted, um, the first thing we did was we increased all their salaries. Um, and we did this earlier this year or last year. Um, so the minimum wage for those jobs at Google is $15 an hour. That's one. The second thing is, when we went out and actually talked to them, to say, like, what is the problem? What's difficult? You know, what's going on for you? What they actually said to us was, you know, I make ends meet, right? I'm not rich, but I get by. And sometimes it's because they have more than one job. Sometimes it's because they have a spouse. Sometimes they just get by on that, right? Because they have a long commute or what have you. They said the real problem is benefits. Because what happens is, for most companies that employ contractors and then contract them out, what they do is they have a typical plan which says you join and you're eligible for health care after 12 months. And people turn over a lot, right? So a lot of people aren't eligible. The other thing they do is say, you are eligible for health care, but your family isn't, because they don't work for us. So we went to a number of our contractors and our, the companies that manage them and said, what we're hearing is that these folks, so we address the wage issue um, as a starting point. What we're hearing is that the benefits are actually a problem. And so what they agreed to do is to raise the benefits so that you're immediately eligible for health care, you don't have to wait a year, so that you can put dependents on it and they don't have to wait, and that uh, they guarantee that the proportion paid by the employee is a small fraction of what the total overall cost. And the way that's happening is our bill is going up. But it was the right thing to do. And I hope more companies do it. Oh, yes. So, so the question is, what is Google doing to stable, put some of this ethos into the family structure and community? Is that fair? In, in the local community. Um, the answer is, um, not yet as much as we should, but more than we've been doing. Um, we, um, you know, I'll give you some examples. Um, you know, we developed, I, we were talking before, we developed a program called CS First. So in South Carolina, where we have a data center, we just hired a bunch of teachers and said, they're Google employees. They teach computer science, high school teachers, junior high school teachers. Then we went to a local school district and said, we got teachers if you want them. They don't have to teach Google stuff. You don't have to buy our products. We just, we hired some people because we thought they might be helpful. We want to be good citizens. And they developed a program called CS First, which is basically a computer science kit 
to get more kids exposed to computer science. And they ran it in the area, and they put, I think, 12 or 1,400 kids through this program. And we didn't design it again. We don't get paid for it. It's just um, this year we expect, we actually just, we launched it more broadly this year. So far this year, we put 40,000 kids through it, not we. What's happened is we basically put it on the internet, and anyone can download it. Uh, Bill de Blasio in New York said he wants to put 100,000 kids in New York through this. And the idea is just to expose kids to digital skills. Um, in a number of places around the country, Chicago, you know, I was there not too long ago, um, we're doing this thing, uh, that we have a guy named Chris Gentile who's running a program. He's basically recognized that minority-owned businesses are not on the internet at the same rate that white-owned businesses are, right? It's something like thir they're 30 to 40, they are on the internet at 30 to 40 percent of the rate that white-owned businesses are. So basically, he's organized 12-week programs about like how to get your website up. Right? how to advertise, how to get people to come into your, your company. And all these things are things we're trying to kind of bring people you know, more into the digital age and, and be helpful. And then there's a bunch of stuff we're doing with schools and communities. We, you know, we give to Mountain View School District and things like that. Um, you know, there's, there's more to do. Yes, I'm wondering if Google has an employee assistance program. This is a program that provides psychological counseling uh, for employees. And I worked at one for 20 years and, and thought that it really helped people increase their productivity. Yeah, we, we actually we have a couple variations. One is um, we actually have in-house a handful of trained clinical psychologists. And we use them a lot for coaching, but also kind of if you just need someone to go to. Uh, we also have a group of Googlers who've organized, because a lot of things are bottoms up and our employees call themselves Googlers. Everything is Google everything. Like, it's a little crazy. Like if you're, you know, the Googlers are employees. Uh, we have an affinity group for folks who are LGBT, and they call themselves the Gaglers. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the one for people over a certain age, they call themselves the Greglers. So like every, everything is, you know, some corruption of that or corruption of that. Um, so there's a group of Googlers who have offered themselves, and they get training and psych training and to be a resource for things like that. We also have an external line. Um, which is completely confidential, and all we get back from that is data. Here's a number of calls, here's the character of it. If somebody actually you know, doesn't feel comfortable coming inside the company, because that's reasonable, um, so they can just turn to somebody in complete confidence and get counsel and support. And it's a great program. Last question up here. Hi, Laszlo. I'm a learning and development professional at UC Berkeley. Hi. And I'm wondering what uh, learning and, de and development opportunities you offer your Googlers. Um, thanks, and so sorry about all the stuff I said about Berkeley. Um, <laughs> The, um, the, we, it's funny, when I joined, we didn't really do any. Because um, the, the big problem I, when I joined in 06 was just recruiting, like finding lots and lots and lots of people. Um, and, you know, 3 million applications a year, we hire 5,000. So the filter, we try to, you know, you'll appreciate, we, we try to avoid what are called false positives. So we actually probably overlook a bunch of people who are good um, because we just want to get it right every single time, right? And, um, and, so when it comes to our history with learning and development, what we started with was very little of that, because we figured, like, you know what, if you hire exceptional people, like, they're going to teach themselves. Like, they'll figure it out. And we didn't have the resources, you know, going back to, yeah, it's just Google. We didn't have the resources to do it. Right? We didn't have the headcount. We didn't have the budget. What grew out of that, and now we have, like, some very cool executive development programs and manager development programs and things like that. Um, two things I'll share. One is that um, we did this thing called Project Oxygen. Um, which is in the book, but you can Google it, and it's, uh, it was, there was a New York Times article years ago. It was basically about how do you make, make great managers um, and sort of, you know, figured out how that works. And underpinning that, there's all these attributes that make great managers, and it's not rocket science. It's just, you know, normally we're too lazy to do it, right? So someone who's actually a really effective manager, they consistently have a one-on-one. -on -one. They will meet one-on-one -on -one with each of their team members on a regular basis. That's a lot of work. Right? Like, as a manager, that's kind of a pain. But the ones who do it are better managers. Great managers are good coaches. So around each of these sort of attributes of great management, we built a course that is very targeted. And then there's follow-up, and we measure the behavioral outcomes. So if you take the manager as a coach course, it's all about how do you, how do you not tell someone the answer, but how do you bring them along and inspire? And people who've taken that course on a scale of 100 score seven points better, are scored seven points better by their teams than before they take in the course when measured six months after the intervention. So we do very targeted things like that. The coolest, the biggest thing, most of the training, most of the learning that happens at Google that's not kind of on the job, you just figure stuff out, is delivered by other Googlers. We have a program called Googler to Googler. 
There's 5,000 people, so we have 55,000 employees. 5,000 are signed up for this. And on our learning and development team, we have instructional designers. And they work together and say, I want to teach a course on history of the bicycle, or you know, wine appreciation, or computer science, right? or how to give a presentation, or selling skills. And these 5,000 Googlers have said, yeah, I want to do that. And they spend between one and eight hours a year teaching. And last year, they together taught something like, I think it's 150,000 hours of content to our employees, the bulk of our work in terms of training and development. Because it turns out the very best people to teach something are actually the ones who are doing it day to day. And one of the things I, I realized in writing this was that if you look around your organization, usually there's like a superstar, but almost everybody is exceptional at one thing, right? If you define it narrowly enough, find the person who's very, very good at that one thing and have them teach it, and it's amazing. You actually like have the world's experts in your own organizations. You just you know, overlook them because they're not that one person everyone gravitates towards. So that's how we approach it. Um, so with that, um, I'll duck outside and uh, happy to sign books. Uh, so thank you all very much.